of cricket, last stories with me in New York Hagram. Today we're joined by Manus Labuschagne. So Manus, you were born in uh, South Africa. Talk us through your early childhood um, and your earliest cricketing memories. Yeah, I mean, my first cricketing memory started from a very young age. Um, obviously, I was born in South Africa and um, um, my earliest cricket memories were probably when I was two or three years old and my mum throwing me tennis balls in the backyard on a concrete slab my dad poured so I could hit some balls um, or so we can get some even bounce on this concrete slab. Um, yeah, and that was from a very young age. Um, my uncles, both my uncles from South Africa, had a big influence. They always played with me um, when I tired my mum and dad out. Um, so, yeah, that's probably my really early cricket memories when I was about two or three. And then um, from there, I mean, we moved over here when I was um, 10. And that's sort of where my journey began in Australia and, and, and junior cricket in Australia and then sort of flowing on from there. And then you, when you came over, am I correct in saying that you actually didn't speak English? It was all Afrikaans. So how did you find that um, transition and cultural shift, etc.? Um, yeah, so that's sort of how it started. I... Um, I didn't know much English at all. Um, you know, I knew enough to probably get around the playing ground, around the playground. But in terms of in-class learning, um, yeah, it was very, very low. Um, but I mean, I think kids adapt and learn more when they're younger as well. Um, you know, you pick things up quicker. You know, things aren't as hard to learn because you don't have as many habits set in their ways. You know, you're not as... Um, rigid in your adapting to, to things. So you adapt to a new situation a lot quicker when you're younger. And then um, your earliest um, childhood cricketing hero? Oh, look, growing up, I, 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 I love Jack Callis. Um, you know, I always love that thought of being an all-rounder, um, player, being in every facet of the game, being able to bat, bowl, field. Um, you know, you almost, you know, when I was a kid, um, you know, there's different stages in my life, but you know, where I went, geez, I want to, you know, you want to bat like Ricky Ponting, bowl like Shane Warne and field like, field like John T. Rhodes, you know, they were like the three, you know, you always try to mimic those sort of three and those different facets of the game. Um, yeah. And that's why I really fell in love with Jack Callis. Um, you know, he was probably, well, he's probably been the best there ever was, um, an all round in terms of, Averaging 55 in Test cricket with 292 wickets and maybe 300 catches. So that's a pretty um, amazing effort there. And then you came through the Queensland system. If you played that, nearly every level under 12s, 15s, 17s, and 19s. Um, talk us through how your talent got spotted um, and. Am I right in saying there was kind of a little bit of talk that you weren't always converting some starts that you were getting? And then and talk us through the link up with Neil Da Costa. I believe you were 17, 18, and how that changed your game moving forwards. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I was I probably my talent or my ability was picked up from a very young age. Um, I was about 11 when I joined. So we arrived in South Africa when I was in Australia when I was ten. When I was eleven, I joined up with the Queensland Emerging Players, which is like um, you know for young players coming through. Um, and then yeah, uh, my journey sort of began there. Um, I went through seventeens, nineteens, and you know the age group stuff. Um, but for me, um, you know they were all very very good good experiences. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I would never say I was the most talented in those groups either. You know, I was a good player. I, I was probably the most competitive in those groups um, and probably the most passionate. But, yeah, um, there's probably players along the way that had more ability or, no, yeah, but as you would call it, talent. Um, um, yeah, and, and I think I played two year, a year of first grade or two years of first grade and um, I met Neil at a camp, uh, a training camp where I was coaching. And I sort of finished the year in club cricket. And I had a sort of, you know, I think I ended up getting two first grade hundreds. You know, and I was, you know, steady. I was all right. Um, and I went there and I just decided, look, I want to take my game to the next level. Um, 
and obviously I wasn't contracted at this stage. I was just playing club cricket and I was like, right, I want to, um, you know, how can I get myself better? So I ended up going to see Neil and um, that coincided with, um, I was there for about eight days, went to see him and then um, I got on a plane um, to go to England the day after I came back um, for six months. And um, yeah, and that's sort of where that journey really began and, and, and kicked off because I, I ended up scoring maybe over a thousand runs in the the season in um, Kent and in the Kent Premier League. Came back and then got um, got a hundred in a one day in the first couple of games. Then got ninety and then got another ninety and then I was playing for Queensland um, the first Shield game of the season. So it all happened very quickly. And then yeah, that journey has sort of just grown, you know, over time. Yeah, so obviously a lot of players, as you go up this, go through the system, you come across a lot of different coaches, etc. What was that special relationship that you shared with him? What qualities in him uh, meant that you know Marnus Lambert and Neil DeCosta kind kind of um, gel with it? Um, what made him a good coach for you specifically? Oh. Uh, Look, his knowledge of batting and a, a, a specifically batting technique is very good. Um, so that kind of resonated with me straight away because I'm quite a technical person. I love thinking about the game deeply. Um, so that was probably the early stages where we literally revamped everything, my whole technique, in seven days. Um, you know, went from, you know, changed my grip, my stance, my back lift, the way I thought about the game. You know, every part of the game, the way I ate, the way I drank, like, you know, coffee, how much sugar I had, we changed everything, like full on rehaul. Um, and that was really good. Uh, I think, you know, did, he, did he suggest doing that? Because obviously you've got to a very high level playing how you had. Um, when that's put in front of you, how would you react? How did you react? I think you can only get better. I mean, I, I was like, well, I went down there and I put all my eggs in the basket. And I said, look, I'm going to have full faith in um, in in him. Um, and, and you know, it, obviously it paid off, you know, looking at it now, bigger scale. But back then, I mean, I felt like I had nothing to lose because I was like, well, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, I have another average year in grade cricket and that's, you know, that's not that's not what I was after. I wanted to be better. I wanted to be the best. So how do I do that? Um, and that was probably the realization that you know I've probably been you know as he described it actually he described it very well. You know you're like the kid that just keeps running through the wall. You know you're more determined than anyone else, but you're not doing the right things. You know like I'm 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 doing everything. I'm trying to hit more balls than anyone else, and I'm trying to train more than anyone else. But you're not doing the right things. If you're not doing the right things, it doesn't matter how much of the wrong thing you're doing, it's still not going to get you into the right path. Um, and, yeah, and I think he just, you know, cleared up a lot of structure, gave me that, you know, that more attacking mindset, which is something that I really lacked growing up as a kid. And, yeah, and then and that's sort of where the journey started when I was 17. And then I went to England, came back, and, you know, that journey's gone on now till obviously now still. Yeah, you touched on your time in England. You played, um, I think, a couple of seasons uh, for Plymouth and then in the, was it Sandwich uh, Club? In, yeah, in Sandwich League? Town, yeah. How, um, how was it? Oh, I loved it. As a Absolutely cultural experience as well as a playing experience as well. The whole, whole both, package both, as a youngster coming both over. Both teams were amazing. Both teams were phenomenal. Um, you know, the first year I was quite a young. I was, I was 17, so... So yeah, I was 17, I turned 18 over there. And and I think that was, oh no, maybe I was 18. I was 18. Um, and that, oh, that was just a learning experience, you know, the pressure of being the overseas for a club, um, training, the standard I wanted to set, um, you know. And, and I had a decent year the first year in the Devon Premier League. And then the second year in Kent Premier League was awesome. And um, that's where I really took my game to another level. And Pretty much everything. I just encompassed everything. My, my, my fitness level. My, you know, for, for every facet of my game, I really um, worked on. Yeah, and then that sort of pushed me um, into, you know, when I first got into the squad, 
um, you know, I was ready for that step up because, you know, my game was in order. I knew how to train well. I knew what to do. I knew how to prepare for different games, although I hadn't been there yet. So is that something, for example, if a youngster came up to you, um, is that something you'd encourage um, to kind of go out of your comfort zone, play in different uh, countries, experience different conditions, cultures, etc.? Is that something you'd encourage? Oh, 100%. I mean, it's probably going to be tough now with the situation we're in um, currently, but I, I, that was one of the best experiences of my life, not only as a as a learning for an, for an adult, for me shifting from a, um, a you know, a young, a young boy to like an adult where I, you know, had to learn how I wanted to actually, and, and I think it teaches you more about, you know, what you actually want. You know, you, you can easily go and play a, a season in, you know, county or club cricket and then go, okay, well, I'm just going to switch off or I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to enjoy the time where, or you can really have a crack and, you know, make sure you're ticking all the boxes and making sure you're doing all the right things. And then 2014-15, I think, was it one academy game? I don't know, you come through the ranks, played the one academy game, then you made your debut for for Queensland's 80 on debut. Yeah, it was actually the other way. It was actually the other the way? Other way? Yeah, go on, explain it. Yeah, so I um, I was playing club cricket the week, um, the week, and I and I was I was a top run scorer at that stage in club cricket, um, in the first five games maybe, um, and then I, um, I got selected for the second eleven, so the academy game, um, and um, Usman Khawaja broke his finger, um, so I actually got called up to play um, the first Shield game. But I hadn't ever played second eleven cricket, so that was I got called up straight from club cricket to the to the um, to the you know Queensland first team, and um, yeah, I did well in my first game. I got eighty three, I think, um, and then and that's when I started really learning the game and the you know the different the struggles and of, of playing first class cricket. You know, you're backing up. I'd never played a you know a four dayer before, so that was my first four dayer. And I remember walking out for the second innings feeling so tired, you know, like, how am I going to bat? Like, how do I bat in these conditions? I'm, I'm cooked. Um, yeah, so there's so many things that you learn then. And then I got dropped after five games. Yeah, and then that's sort of, you know, well, you just learn. You're continually learning. And then I didn't get a contract at the end of that year. And then the following year, um, you know, I said, right, well, I'm just going to, train here I went you know back and we, we trained by myself and and really got myself ready um and and then um I got a few practice games with Queensland at the start of the following year and um I ended up getting 90 and and a 70 in the first two games and and, and somehow I got picked in the in the team again so it was um you know it's very you know different probably start to then a lot of other people but you know it's definitely one I wouldn't give up then when you eventually did get your contract, obviously you now professional cricketer are playing the Queensland team. Um, for any youngster looking on, can you give a little bit of advice like, via your own personal journey? What kind of stuff that were you doing through your career which led you to success? Marnus Labashe, now a professional cricketer. As I said, a lot of people want to make that step up. Any advice you would give? Some, some tips for youngsters looking on? Um. I think one of the things for me is probably the best advice I got is just to not be rigid in your thinking and and actually be adaptable and be open to to thinking about the game and how to go about the game. I think for a long time, I really struggled because I always thought there was one perfect way to bat, you know, and I was always aspiring to be that perfect batter, you know, if that was trying to bat like Sachin Tendulkar, you know, with the perfect back lift you know, or Virat Kohli or whoever it was, you know, Jack Callis or Raul Dravid, you know, those, you know, you always wanted to bat with a perfect technique. And, and and that's where I probably struggled a bit because I tried for probably four or five years even in first-class cricket trying to do that. I kept trying to bat with a perfect technique and the perfect this and that. And probably only in the last two or two years probably, I've really just my thinking of trying to be a run scorer, finding ways to score runs 
and being able to adapt my batting or my technique or whatever it is to suit the conditions and to go, okay, well, I can bat like this today. I can have this back lift or this grip or this, you know, I can do this today and then I can do something different tomorrow. Does that ability you know, that, to adapt, is, is that, is, would that be fair to say? Yeah, exactly. But I think it's more than that for, for I think, kids growing up because I think when you're a kid growing up, you're always, I mean, I know what I did as a kid, you're always aspiring for that one person you want to bat like, you know. So if it's, you know, whoever, who's, you know, if it's Steve Smith, you know, his favourite player is Mark Waugh. You know, you're always, you know, going to, you, you, you take elements of that person's game in upon your own game as a kid because you're like, oh, I love batting like that person. Same as you watch now and you watch kids bat now and they're trying to bat like Steve Smith. You yeah. know, so um, I think that's the element that as a kid you always pick up. Um, and I think And I think sometimes you try really hard to bat like that person. You know, you try and do it that way, you know. As a kid, you know, you know, I wanted to bat like Jacques Callas. So, you know, I had my elbow up and, and whatnot and, you know, the big pre-movement and, you know, it's different stages, you know. I love watching Sachin and the way he batted. So, you know, I think you got to find your own way and your own the way you bat. You know, there's definitely elements of the game that are definitely made easier if you do the technical things right. But, um, yeah, it's definitely those things about, um, you know, not trying to get too caught up and trying to bat like someone, trying to bat like yourself. And then is there also an element about um, enjoying the game and not kind of being stifled in terms of wanting it too much as a youngster, trying to make the next step? Uh, a word on that, yeah, maybe? Yeah, look, it's, oh, look I, I know exactly what you're saying. It's very hard because you know when you're a youngster, all I wanted was to make that rep team, you know, to make that under-19 team, to make that team. You know, that's all you wanted for that. You know, that 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 part then, making the under-19s Queensland team or Australian team, meant everything to you at that stage in your life. Now, you look at a big picture now where I am sitting now and you look back and you go, well, that didn't really matter. Like, if I didn't make it or if I didn't make it, it wouldn't have had a an outcome in where I am today. Um. But I think you also need to learn as a kid setbacks and need to learn um, how to come back from failure because I think that's one thing for sure. When you come into first-class cricket, it doesn't matter who you are or how good you are, um, you're going to need to learn to come back from that because if you don't, you're going to get caught out. And then 2017-18 season, would you say that was the major breakthrough season for yourself? Um, it's got over a 1,000 runs for Queensland, I mean, top run scorer uh, for them in the Sheffield Shield, which then led, led to the, to the call-up in the Australia side. How, how's your game at that stage? Um, yeah, I mean, that was just another stepping stone, really. Uh, the years before, you know, I'm pretty sure the year before that, I, I averaged, oh, I think I got, you know, I got something like six or seven fifties and I didn't end up getting a hundred. I got a 99 and 96. I got, you know, a couple of nineties. Um, yeah, I definitely was a, you know, it was a year that I, you know, I was able to be very consistent with my batting and actually put some runs on the board. Um, but even, even through that season, I had my doubts. I had, you know, I was doubting myself at some points. That year, you know, I remember calling um, my manager and saying, gee, I just can't buy a run at the moment. Um, and I was just like, oh, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get through it? And end up getting 100 in the second innings of the next game. And then I ended up getting another 100 um, a game later. And then all of a sudden it snowballed into something, you know, a lot bigger again, you know. Um, it, so it happens so quickly in our game and you've got to make sure you're clear, you're thinking clear and you keep trusting your ability because I think that's what I learned that year was that, you know, it doesn't matter what the circumstances look like, but you've got to make sure you're ready for each innings because, you know, your next innings is the one that counts, you know. You can talk about the innings that have gone, you know, you missed out a few games, but the only one that counts is the next game. 
and eventually when you did get the the call up and then eventually your test cap the baggy green against pakistan in the uae what does the baggy green mean to you there's a lot of i've on this channel i've interviewed uh, several australians stuart mcgill jeff lawson um stuart law they've all had their say what it meant what does it mean to you oh look um oh it means a lot i mean you know, it, it's probably the best way to put it. It's a, it's your childhood dream coming to reality. But when you dream about that as a child, you don't really know what it takes to get there. And that's the part that's probably, the, you know, the best, you know. When you actually get that cap, it's gone from that childhood dream where you're like, I want to play for Australia. I want the baggy dream. And at that point in your life when you're a kid, you know, you're envisaging yourself playing for Australia in the backyard, playing backyard cricket. There's no hard work that's gone into that. It's just enjoyment. It's just fun. It's just that. But then when you get that baggy green, you know, you know, you, you might have been struggling in shield cricket for a year or two and you've come back from that. You might have been dropped three or four times and come back from that. You might have then, you know, got dropped from shield cricket and then come back in shield cricket and then found your way back. So it, it means so much because it takes so much to get there. And then once you're there, you realise, well, now the hard work begins, you know, because now, and Justin Langer put it this, you know, you go from the hunting to the hunted, you know, like originally, you know, you're always going, you know, every time you get 100, you might, you know, in shield cricket, you might be, you know, on the front cover or you might be, you know, it'll pop up somewhere going, oh, you know, mine has got 100. But when you're the Australian player, every time you get zero, that's what it says, failed again or like, you know, it doesn't score runs. So it's a big difference because prior to that, you could get five ducks in a row. No one would know, no one, no one write anything about it. But then you get the hundred and it's the top news link, but people go, well, you're still averaging 15, but you just got a hundred. But no one knows that. People just go, oh, you just got a hundred. So it, it, it's a big mental change, um, that shift from, you know, being the Australian player and then being consistent, keep scoring runs. That's why there's so much respect for guys like Steve Smith and David Warner. You know, you see them come back to shield cricket and they just bang runs after runs after runs. And that's what, you know, that's what it takes to be world class. And then in the you know, first couple of innings, a um, couple of low scores, but then kind of a general question as a batsman yourself. Say you're going through um, a lean spell, not getting the big, big score that you expect. Any tips for aspiring cricketers, current players, etc.? Um, what kind of things do you do to get yourself out of uh, a mini rut, etc.? Do you have processes that you go through, etc.? To kind of keep yourself um, back into form, if that's you know, if that's even you know, if there's actually a blueprint, is there a blu blueprint that you try and follow? Um, I think every batter knows that's that's come that that's played for long enough knows that the game can be very challenging sometimes. That the game can put you in a position where you you know you always start doubting yourself. The key is to just keep making sure you keep the game process driven, not results driven, and that's very hard. Because, you know, we all walk out there every day and we go, I want to get 100 today. And then the problem is in our game, everything under 100 is a fail. So you go out there and, oh, okay, well, I'm going to fail today. Instead of taking it more as a process and going, well, doesn't matter how many runs I get today, but am I staying true to the way I want to play and what I want to do? You know, am I reading the game? Am I understanding what's going on right now? Am I understanding what shots I can and can't play? Am I understanding where I want to hit this ball? What I want to do to this bowler? And, and, and then just playing that, you know, you're not... And that's probably the biggest thing I've learned. I've learned to play less at my end and more at the other end. So instead of me trying to think about what I'm doing as a batter, I'm thinking about what the bowler's doing and then trying to maybe change what I'm doing to adapt to what he's doing. Where probably, if you asked me this two years ago, all the focus was on me. I was like, I've got to do this to be, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do that. And then I'd get out and I'd go, well, 
that he was doing this. I knew what he was doing. You know, I had the vision two or three days before I was watching them bowl and I knew that's what he was doing. Why didn't I come up with a better plan? So I think that's probably the part where I would say that just yeah, learning, learning from the game and, and being able to play what's in front of you, not just trying to be, you know, a technician and try and make sure you're doing things right all the time. Does it, would it be fair to say that, you know, you hear a lot of commentators say that, um, you know, a batsman's mind is scrambled. Is that kind of what you're saying in terms of like you try to overthink your own game as opposed to concentrating what's coming down in front of you? So would that be hundred percent? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very good it's a very good sum up. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, and you know as a batter when you're at that stage, you're thinking so much at your end. You're all about, you know, oh geez, he's bowling like this. Okay, I'm gonna do this, that, this, that, and then you know. You, you you get yourself into trouble. Where um yeah where that's where I would say that yeah you're spot on. It's really good sum up. And then uh, then when you come over to Glamorgan, uh, 2019 again you turn out thousand championship run, uh, three hundred and four in four games. How was how's your time there? Enjoy it. I oh, loved it, loved it, and I think you probably see that because I've signed for another couple of years. Um. Absolutely loved it. Matt Maynard was was tremendous. Um, I actually spoke to him a couple of days ago. He FaceTimed me um, when we were chatting. Um, but yeah, he's tremendous. Um, he was amazing for me. Once again, it was just, it was like it was just the perfect storm, really. Um, you know, the perfect combination um, because I met him at the perfect time where that's exactly what I needed in my game. Someone to teach me what I just said. Um, teach me that ability to think what's in front of me, not to think too much about technique, but how can I actually put pressure back on the bowler and how can I go about that? And he was amazing at that. Um, and, and, and his knowledge and his thoughts on the game really resonated with me. And um, we were able to, you know, work on a few technical changes that really helped me in England, especially, but probably, you know, helped me, to where I am now. I don't think I could have done it without, um, even it, well, it was just four months period there, but Matt Maynard was very influential. And just being able to help me be there for every game, see the game and understand and talk to about the game and bounce ideas off and, and go, what do you think of this? Okay, I'm going to do this today. And he go, perfect, let's see it. Like go out there and, and, and do it. Um, and at times it came off and then sometimes it failed. Um, Luckily, that season, it came off more than it didn't. Um, but, yeah, I think that was the part I, I learned a lot from, from him and, and, and from that season. Would it be fair to say, did he give you that kind of freedom to express yourself? Definitely. Uh, definitely. I mean, it was a combination of both. I mean, um, when I went to England, you know, Neil, um, Neil actually said to me on the phone, he called me, probably a couple of days before I left. And he said, like, you know, your chances, yeah, your, your time's running out. You know, you're not going to have many more opportunities to play for Australia. You know, you've got to take these opportunities. Um, no one cares how you bat. The only thing that matters is runs. You know, people are only looking at the runs column. And, 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 and I mean, we're very frank with each other, very honest, you know. Um, and, and that was a really thing I needed to hear at that stage because I was like, right, I've got to stop getting caught up in that part of the game and, and, and just play what's in front of me. And then, um, and then, you know, obviously getting over there, Matt Maynard really gave me that confidence to express what my thoughts and my game and how I thought about the game. And was, I was able to then go out there and play with that freedom because I was really trusting the way I thought about the game. and. Probably no coach prior to that had given me that amount of confidence in my game. And um, maybe maybe not in my game, but in my thoughts and in how I thought about the game and said, right, oh, I like it. Like, I like what you're thinking there. And, um, yeah, so that was, that was very good. And then you go into the Ashes series. Obviously, there's a lot of talk. Everyone knows about how you go on the side via the concussion sub route, got 50-odd. But I want to just talk about kind of the mental side of the game. You must have 
been feeling a lot of pressure when you you know you're not even in the side then you come in then you go out you get struck uh, by Joffre Archer go on and get half century it says a lot about your kind of mental strength and in terms of the mental side of the game a lot of talk is about technical side um, etc but do you do do you do any kind of work on your mental preparation you know is it do you do breathing exercises visualization what kind of stuff do you do in terms of that uh, training that aspect of the game um well I'll answer that question firstly um it's a weird it's a weird thing to say um but i didn't feel the pressure in that game or or not a lot of it at least i mean all the pressure i felt was probably more viewed from the outside in you know it was more external pressure that people were going how you know this is a tough situation but in my mind you know this is the way i thought about it. well coming in for steve smith he averages 65 People aren't expecting me to set the world on fire. I've come in here in probably the toughest time to bat. So either way, if I succeed, people are going to go, wow, you know, that was very good. And if I fail, people are going to go, well, you probably can't judge him on that innings. So in my mind, I thought about that. Once again, I'm probably an overthinker of the game. So I actually took that opportunity and said, right, oh, well, I can, you know, play with freedom, you know, because I'm, I'm playing the way I want to play. And, I got in the contest, obviously, when I got out there, you know, there was pressure, you know, they were bowling well, Joffre was bowling fast, but that sort of takes care of itself as long as you have, you know, those mental routines, you have you have your routine set, and, and, and that's why you need a routine and you need um, different things to do when you're under pressure and understanding what you need to do to make sure it brings you back to the neutral, brings you back to the now, and it gives you an understanding. Through that of, routine that you, that you mentioned? Um, yep. So, um, I do a different routine for different situations. So, um, my probably more normal one is, um, when the ball's bowled, um, I walk probably more when I'm under pressure, I would walk to, um, sort of 45 backwards from the stumps, make a little mark on the ground, then walk back, scratch middle twice, um, tap the bat, uh, Tap the bat twice and then tap the bat one more time, three times, and then sort of bend my knees a little bit as I bring the bat up to just relax my knees a little bit and then have my hands in the right position. And then from there, that's sort of the routine part of it done. And then different times. So when I'm feeling like I'm going really well, I won't walk to, to 45. I'll then do some gardening on the pitch or, you know, do different things. Um, but before you're when going I need out to go to bat, before you're going out to bat, do you do anything to kind of calm the nerves? And does your preparation from the mental side change uh, from, say, like the beginning of Test Week to to that point when you're just about to actually walk out? Or do you always? Um, have I think I think whenever you're coming up against a big test, you're always. Th or, 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 this is just me, but you're always thinking about the bowlers. You're thinking about the bowlers, what they bowl, how you're going to play them, what you're going to do. I think. You know, whenever I have spare time, I'm not consciously standing there, you know, trying to envision it. But it's in there the whole time. It's ticking over, playing left arm spin. Where am I going to bat? What am I going to do? Playing Jofra Archer, you know, where he's angling the ball back at your pad. Playing broad, coming wide of the crease, angling it in. Playing Wokes, who's angling it away, um, bowling probably more back of the line. Like those things are just churning away in your mind. And subconsciously at training, you're working at ways to figure those things out. Um, yeah, so I think that's the part that the mentally, so when you're sitting there waiting, you're just picking up that information by looking at the TV. You're going, yep, okay, that's doing that. Um, okay, yep, he's swinging it away, he's angling it back in or whatever it is. And you're just gaining that information. So when you go out there, that you're ready to go. And then in that series, Headingley, there's a lot said about Ben Stokes and his antics with the bat. But I want to pick up that spell that he bowled to you. Um, I know you got 70 odds in tough conditions. How was that as a spell? And also, as you mentioned, Headingley is known in England that 
He swings around a lot. Um, a few tips about actual playing swing bowling. A lot of people say see it early and play it late. Um, if you can go a little bit deeper in, in your thought process about playing swing bowling. Um, what do I have for you? Um, probably two things. I, I actually say still to this day, it's probably one of the best spells of bowling I've ever faced. Um, that second innings, I remember me and Matthew Wade um, coming into the middle and, well, we're batting for probably half an hour, or an hour maybe even, it felt forever. And he was bowling and we were just like, mate, this is like, this is unplayable. Like, we're just hanging, hanging, just hanging. And we're taking it over at a time, a ball at a time. And you remember saying that, walking or talking there and going, this is one of, this is so, like, this is, he was bowling balls that were just unplayable. He was bowling fast. He was angling the ball in at you. I think I nicked off twice, got dropped a few times. Like, and I remember that was one of the best spells I'd faced. And I'd probably say, prior to that, that first innings at Headingley, I would count as my best test innings I've ever played. Um, the 74 out of the 90, 190 we got. Um, just because it was one of those days where I just felt like the conditions were tough. But in my own mind, where I was at mentally and watching the ball, it was very clear. I was very focused on. Um, yeah, I was so focused on the ball. I actually felt like it was really hard to get me out. Um, you know, I felt like, you know, I got to a stage. That's why I was so filthy when I got out to the full toss because I actually felt like out of most innings that I've played, that innings, I was like, it, yeah, I don't think they can get me out here. You know, I remember like thinking that. I was like, I, I feel so, wherever they're bowling, I feel like I, I almost, like you said, seeing the ball real early. Um, and you don't always have that, you know, different light, different, the sun's in a different spot, whatever it is. Um, the ball's not always as easy to see. Um, tips on swing bowling. Um, probably one of the biggest things I learned over in England um, was swing bowling is probably to play with the angle of the swing. Um, so, like, you know, I think as bad as we always get caught up in trying to play real straight, you know, trying to play the ball back down the ground. And I think actually in England, you have to play the ball a bit squarer. Um, you have to hit the ball more, you know, through cover, through extra cover um, with the angle of the swing if it's an outswing. And then obviously the opposite way, if he's bowling in swing, you don't want to hit the ball down the ground. You want to hit the ball sort of to mid wicket or to square leg with the angle of the swing. Would you also look to kind of uh, bat outside um, your crease? and? A lot of people say you've got to watch the ball out the hand in terms of which way it shines, but that's kind of it's easier said than done. That you know, um, is do you look for a little tip like that or angle of wrist position, um, arm position, etc.? Does that come into your uh, thought process? A hundred percent, yeah. So subconsciously, you're always picking up little cues. So you're looking for the ball. You see the seam. I'm always looking for the seam. See if I can see the angle of the seam, where the seam's bouncing. Um, where it's actually bouncing on the seam, seeing if I can, you know, pick up any cues that's going to help me. But once again, that's so dictated to by light. You know, some days, I remember that day, because it was overcast, um, the ball was actually quite clear to see with the new ball because it was shiny, but it was quite dusky look. Sometimes when it's really bright, um, the ball doesn't really reflect that well with the sun. Um, so I remember that day, was, I found it like I saw the ball real early and the swing and the seam. And I almost felt like as it came out of his hand, I knew what shot I wanted to play already. Um, yeah, so I think any cues you can pick up as you're running in, um, sometimes it's really hard to, to sort of, I try and watch the ball maybe early when he's running up to see if I can pick up any cues, wrist position, wrist angle shiny side rough side depending on if it's reversing and then the next point i'm sort of looking at is more delivery so where the ball actually goes i don't think i don't i subconsciously don't think i try and watch the ball you know through that part i think i try and watch the ball here and then i try and then switch my focus to release point and then would you would you ever look to that outside your crease, change guard. Would you ever? Hundred percent. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, all the time. Just depending on once again what the bowler's doing, what the ball's doing. 
um, and then just trying to play those, play the numbers game, really. Um, so, yeah, if Muhammad Abbas is coming in and he's trying to bowl straight and hit me on the pad, I know his mode of dismissal is LBW. So, you know, you're batting out of your crease to try and eliminate that and and put a bit of pressure back on him to say, well, how are you going to get me out now? Because LBW is, um, is almost out of the equation. So you just keep shifting the statistics of the game into your favour. Yeah. And then, obviously, Australia retained the Ashes 2-2 uh, two, two, two drawn series and you mentioned Mohammed Abbas um f- first test 100 against Pakistan you went big and then you followed it up with uh 100 of the next test match and then against um New Zealand and obviously you've gone on in the one day side um getting your first 100 against South Africa in terms of building an innings and going big um is that when you know when you first when you first got your test hundred? Did you feel is that when you really felt that you know I can really really perform at this level? And also, any tips and advice of kind of building an innings, going big, mm-hmm. that youngsters, aspiring cricketers, um, young professionals can get some tips from you. For, um, firstly, I think the day I thought that I could do it was at Headingley. Headingley. After that first innings, that was the day that I remember going like. I'm I'm up to this. I'm at this level because I felt so confident that day in how I played the game. Um, but the hardest thing is to get your first hundred because you've never been in that territory before. So people can say what they want. It's like getting your first shield hundred. It's just as hard because you've never been there. So you get into the nineties and you're like. What do I do? I remember, you know, when I got that first 100 against Pakistan, I got to about 80 odd and I started panicking. I started panicking. I started trying to play. I think I played like this sort of flick through the leg side off Yasser Shah and I was off like a like a length ball and it was a bit of a loose shot and I just managed somehow to just hit it out of the middle. And I think I went, I went to 91 then and I just remember thinking to myself, what was that? Like that was completely not in my you know, repertoire, my thinking pattern. But that's what happens when you're under pressure. And when you haven't been in the spot before, you start doing things that you wouldn't normally do. Um, but then once again, once you get that 100, it's almost like the relief. Because then it's like, okay, I'm, I've done it. Like I've been here. Now you can almost go, okay, I can start again. Now I can actually do this because now when you get there the next game you actually go okay I know what to do now just relax stay calm it's going to come just wait for the ball you know whatever it is that you're trying to keep yourself calm um, and then and then I think the biggest thing about scoring big runs and I've learned this from from Steve um, is just that ability to stay in your focus so whatever that looks like for you, you know for me it's different to Steve no, I'm more talkative. I like talking about the game. That helps release me and keeps me focused. Him at times doesn't want to do that. You know, he's really focused in his own thoughts. He doesn't need to express them. So he just stays here and I'm just sort of managing with him and we're just, you know, batting together. Um, but yeah, that's one thing I learned from him. And, and, and actually, to be fair, David Warner as well, um, you know, talking to him, you know, we're probably a lot more similar in the way we, um, you know, in the middle, you know, we like talking, you know, the running between wickets, probably the, you know, yeah, just that energy at the crease is a little bit higher. And I think that's, once again, it's just part of that learning the players you're batting with. But that's probably one of the things I would say is finding a way to stay in your bubble and staying in your focus um, is the best way to then go on and get big runs. When you talk about your own uh, focus on bubble, do you ever look at the scoreboard and see what you're on? Do you count your scores in Always. tens, etc.? No, no. Uh, look, I've been through different phases where I used to do that. No, not at all. Um, I, I, my biggest thing is I just concentrate on the next ball. That's more sort of my whole thing. If I find myself trying to move too far forward, um, you know, yeah, all I'm trying to think is next ball, trying to gain. Excuse me. Um, trying to gain as much information as I can from the ball that's gone. So if it's swung away, 
you know, if he's bowled five away swingers, you know, or if Joffre Archer's run in and he's bowled four full balls, you know, getting an understanding of the field, okay, is he going to go bouncy, is he not? And then just keep changing the way you're setting up to, to adapt to what, what one, what you think is going to come, but you always got to expect that that ball, you know, you always got to expect his ball to get you out and you should have prepared for that anyway. You know, if it's Joffre Archer to the left-hander, you know the nick is in play. You know, that's how he's going to get your Stuart Broad to the left-hander. They're going to try and nick you off. So you've got to expect that ball nine, eight times, eight times out of ten. And then you've got to find a way to put pressure back on them to try and stop that ball from being an eight times out of ten ball, trying to get it to be a six out of ten or a five out of ten. There's a lot said about, you know, what, you know the first 20-odd balls are the most important in terms of getting yourself in. Do you have, is it literally just playing each ball on its merits, even at the early stage of your innings? Or... Do you look to play a little bit more def- defensively or is it att- do you always try to Probably take the it- other way. I think you're always trying to be a little bit more aggressive early, like in the first few balls, because you just want to get yourself going. You want to put some pressure back on the bowlers to get them. But like you said, I don't think that always means um, like runs. I don't always think that means, you know, being aggressive and positive doesn't mean that, you know, you need to get off, you know, you need to be 30 off 20. You know, there's so many times actually, you know, watching back one of my innings the other day and, and and I was like, I think I was four off 40. And I felt like, I remember feeling at the time when I was batting, I thought I was playing all the shots. You know, I thought I was walking at him, trying to clip him to the leg side, then walking at him, leaving the ball. But I think that's kind of what I'm sort of saying is that intensity or that intent at the crease. Is it's kind of like when you're when you're communicating, when you're shouting, yes, no, wait, hundred percent, hundred percent. It's all in that, hundred percent. And you, you need to create more, that more aggressively, etc. Hundred percent, because you're trying to get yourself up. You're trying to get your focus. You're trying to get your focus higher and higher and higher. Um, and that's why you know that, that once again, it's something Steve Smith does so well. He's able to get that level of focus when the game, the pressure, boils up his focus can go higher and higher. Um, and I think that's sort of, yeah, the part that I've learned. And then at the time of recording now, um, you're due to come over to England to play um, T20s, three tw- T20s and three one-dayers. For yourself, um, coming into a, you know, a biosecure, Bob no crowd, have you thought about what it's going to be like? Well, I've played one game. We already played one game with no crowd, so you kind of got the feel there, and it was definitely different. But I think all those things I just talked about need to apply, you know, that ability to get yourself up, get yourself going, um, regardless of the crowd um, or the match situation. You need to try and find that. But like I said, it would be good to be back with a team. And, you know, I know it's in a bit of different conditions and different circumstances, but... um, you know, we just got to find a way, got to cr- get cricket back. You know, I know in about, what's the time there? Seven. In about four hours' time, I'll be parking up, watching the test match. So that'll be me set for the for the night, trying to adapt to the English time a little bit, get get to bed a bit later. Um, yeah, so I think they're all things that you need to, you know, I think it's exciting to be back with the team. You know, I can't wait to see everyone and and. And I think get that camaraderie back because it's something that we haven't had for the last, you know, seven months, six months. And then the challenge England will pose to world champions. A word on Owen Morgan's side? Yep. Look, the, the, they are the um, the reigning champions. So, um, you know, we're coming there to to, to, to beat them. And, and, and that's the, you know, we... We've got a very good team as well. And, and I think, you know, we've got a really good balance between, you know, attack and, and, and sort of through that middle. So I think I'm really excited to, to put play against the best. Like you said, you're playing against the best and, um, you know, you want to challenge yourself and see what our team looks like um, up against theirs. I think we're going to be very competitive, um, you know, very excited. Obviously, whenever you're playing, England, there's always a little bit more in it. Um, so yeah, can't wait. And what qualities do you think um, the English side has that has led them to become world champions? 
obviously the one day team has gone through a transformation but from you looking uh, looking on into the England side and having you know going to face them in a few weeks time uh, what qualities do you think they have that makes them the side they are at the moment oh geez um oh they have a few I mean they're, they're stacked with batters and and aggressive batters so I think um in England where you're playing on smaller grounds um you know it definitely helps and it definitely works in their favor they've got guys that um you know through the middle that can be very aggressive yeah they got guys through the middle that can be aggressive they have um i mean yeah they have i mean they're bowlers they've got two class spinners they've got a really deep batting lineup i think wokes is batting at eight you know mo and ali bats at seven Butler six, Morgan's at four, Root three. T Twenty World Cup's obviously been pushed back, but would it also be kind of a a little little statement, a little marker to kind of get one over on English? Oh, definitely. Always, you know, when you go play in England, you want to win. You know, walk away with a with a win, and especially you know our one day record hasn't been amazing um, for the last couple of years. So we want to make sure we address that. And um, you know, at the moment we are. The number one test team, I think, and the, and the number one T uh, Twenty side, and you know we would, you know, but we've been probably not as good in the one day format. So we want to address that and make sure that you know we become the the best um, one day team in the world. And then for yourself, in terms of your own personal game, is it just a case of um, continuing the 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 great form that you've shown over the last uh, twelve months? Look, I, I almost go the other way. I think sort of what happened last 12 months doesn't matter anymore. Um, you know, it's been six months. You know, I've got to find a way. You know, I've had to find a way to get better, you know, because I know that everyone else out there is going to know a bit more about me, going to know my game, going to try and attack me in different ways. Um, so I think the key for me is to keep developing, keep getting better, keep finding ways to put pressure back on the opposition. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to do um so yeah I think that that's the way I approach it at least um and yeah so you always want to keep getting better and always finding a way to um to improve yourself so Manus brilliant uh thank you very much for your time today really appreciate it great talking through your career and also um some great tips that you've given um in this piece which aspiring cricketers etc can um can learn and engage from so thank you very much no, it's a pleasure. So Neil Thank you Kaplan, very much. Cricket Love Stories, Manus Labashane. Thank you.